Good morning and welcome everyone. I am so glad you are here. Whether you are with us here in person, online, or catching us later on YouTube, this is a busy season for us, particularly here at this church where we just held a bazaar yesterday, where many people were doing all kinds of good and important work. And so I invite us today, as we begin here, to just set down the to-do list, set down the worry of and whatever plans are coming or not coming this week, take a few smooth breaths, make our bodies 10% more comfortable, if you can manage, and just settle into this space knowing that our to-do lists and our worries and everything will be will be back to greet us in an hour and 15 minutes or so but we can carve out this time for reflection and stillness and music and connection so come let us gather come let us worship together Hello, I'm Matthew Morris McCormick, a member of the Sunday Services Committee. And I would joyfully like to welcome all to our sacred space, including those joining us on Zoom, and a special appreciation to those of you visiting us for the first time. You are beloved, and you are welcome here. Whether you are feeling brave or brokenhearted, defiant or defeated, fearsome or fearless, you are beloved and you are welcome here. Whether you are gay, straight, bi, pan, lesbian, queer, questioning, trans, cis, genderqueer, non-binary, intersex, agender, beyond words, you are beloved and you are welcome here. In this space of welcome and acceptance, commitment and recommitment of covenant and connection, let us worship together. I'd like to share with you uh, my little version of the Lord's Prayer, which is the theme of today's sermon by, Rachel Lombard, by Reverend Rachel. Our visitors who sit amongst us, hallowed be thy names. Your questions come and none are dumb on Zoom or in church. Give us this day your open hearts and hear our embraces as we hear the embraces from others. And join us not in fathomable fear, but in healthy skepticism, for you are the welcomed, the loved, and the embraced forever and ever. In peace. And as we begin, we have several announcements. Today, this afternoon, following the service, we will have a memorial service for church member Ivan Kleinstecker. So the, a visitation will begin at 1230, and the memorial service will be at 130 today in this space or on Zoom. With the Thanksgiving holiday approaching, most of the staff of this church are taking time off this week. So don't expect things from the church office or the church staff this week. Be patient with the emails and the church building will largely be closed. Next Sunday will be a special service fe featuring preaching and music from the service of the living tradition, which is part of the General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association. The sermon and one piece of music will be recorded. They are both excellent, and the rest of the service will be live in person. So I hope you attend in whatever way makes sense for you. And here is our final bizarre announcement for the church year. I know, it's pretty exciting. So, our aspiration was to offer the, our most successful holiday bazaar ever, and it seems that we did in every meaning of that word. So congratulations to everybody for all of the work we did together. 
So first I have some numbers. These are, um, so the people specialties and the cafe brought in $10,610.70, which is amazing. And there are still some people's specialty items out on the table. So those of you who are here in person know that every all the food that is perishable, which includes some limpa bread and some pies, is pay what you can, because we want that to leave with you today. We do not want any of that food to linger and mold over the Thanksgiving week, okay? So if you can put some money in, in the basket or pay online to the through the church website, and take something with you, that would be great. And there's a few other items as well out there. Um, and our raffle brought in $1,109, which is amazing. Okay, and there are so many people to thank that we're just gonna hold all of our applause to the end, otherwise that will be the entire service, okay? So this year brought many new faces and facets to the bazaar and it showed and it worked. Dolores Strom joined the leadership team with Rochelle and Melissa and brought her mighty talents and ethic of care to all we did. And she's too not going to show herself. Her creative problem solving and innovative thinking sharpened up our operation in so many ways. Rachel Harms took the helm on publicity, having never even seen the event before. And with her teammate, Rick Johnson and talented support from Melissa, and with your help with outreach, we freshened up and extended our PR efforts and added to the Yardside Brigade to get the word out. Sandy Steele had a vision of a possible redo of our cafe on a scale and a space we could manage in order to bring back this beloved tradition and good food to host our artists and volunteers. With teammate Donna McClurkin and with all your help, this was a huge hit and a welcome respite for all. Emily Sipsma led the way to bring our most diverse collection of artists and vendors ever with help from teammate Rochelle. The artist feedback is so positive about our community, the great food and service, your friendliness and the experience here. So thanks to everyone for making our artists feel so welcome. When I go around to greet all of them, they about half of them say, this is my favorite show I do all year. And that means something. Our incomparable Chef Bob, Chef Bob Friedel led with help from so many of you on seven consecutive weekends to make a tasty variety of over 600 pasties to sell as our best known specialty. Those went quickly, you guys. And there were Martha Beverly's team of well-trained Swedish limpa bread makers and so many specialty cookie makers and bakers and jam and all the everything. It was amazing. Lori Rube quietly and steadfastly led the way in our main area people specialties with help from Rachel Bear and with all of your many, many delicious and beautiful contributions, including those made by our RE specialty class kids to reach our highest earnings ever from people specialties. The tables were dwindling by 11 a.m. So mental note, bake more next year. Lori also led our first time ever raffle, which was brilliantly done with very generous contributions collected from our artists and creative help from Colleen Van Slambrook and Diana Lundquist to increase these profits significantly. Full details to come soon. And I and Judy Whitman were two of the three winners. So Judy, before you leave today, get your basket, okay? So we had tremendous help from the very hardworking volunteers who came to set up with Tim Kiefer and Dolores during Monday Madness from Catherine and Gary and our buildings and grounds volunteers who readied our facilities for the event and from the team of gracious greeters who set the tone for all who came into the building from the cashiers and finance team calculating from start to finish and led by Dolores and Barb Davis from the driving team who ran the shuttle like clock clockwork all day long there's so many of you, oh my goodness. For those of you who staffed our sales tables or helped in the kitchen and the cleanup crew volunteers led by Maggie Wilson and Jen Doxa Kohler, who worked diligently to put all this back together in an amazing flurry of hard work and camaraderie. And all of you who came to shop to support our local artists 
to buy lovely homemade goods and wager a little money on the gorgeous raffle baskets. So our collective work has helped support our church financially. And we know that these results have exceeded our hopes. We'll have a final number with, with the expenses taken out to share with you in the next week or so. And our community is strong. When we lean in together, we are capable of so much more than we can imagine, much less accomplish alone. Thank you all. So now is the applause moment for all of these people who did all of this good work. And now we sing. I invite you all to rise and body your spirit to sing our opening song together. of the Latin, it's good. At this point, I would like to invite Desmond the Kid up to light our chalice. Oh, did I say Desmond? DeForest the Kid. I beg your pardon. DeForest. Thank you, DeForest. May the light of this chalice give light and warmth to our community when we are joyful and when we despair. And may we feel the warmth spread from our circle to wider and wider circles until all know they belong to the one circle of life. In addition, to our chalice lit here on Zoom. We know we have many folks joining us on Zoom today. And we have chalices lit in Richland Township, in Westwood, the Leisure Point, Kalamazoo, Gull Road, Galesburg. It is good to all be together in this time, if not all in one place. Now I would like to invite our children up for a conversation. Okay. I am so glad that all of you came to church today. Thank you for coming to be with us. And I know some of you have been here many times and some of you are new and I'm glad you're here. So today I'm going to talk to all these grown ups about prayer. Me, 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 me. And I'm going to tell you guys about how to pray. And this is something I learned in graduate school. And so that would make it about 18th grade. 
I know, right? But you guys get to learn it way before you're in 18th grade. I know. Can you even imagine 18th grade? Yeah. Yes, I can. It's wild. Yes, he's. I I learned about playing my mass. Yeah, you've learned about that already. So first, do you guys know what a prayer is? Yeah. No. You can pray to God. What do you think? Oh, you might move your body in a certain way. Hold your body. Yeah. What do you think? Okay, so for me, prayer is a way to kind of still my body and still my mind and think about how I am connected to other people and other beings and to remember that whatever I might be feeling in that moment will not last forever, right? I think that's an important thing to remember, especially when times are hard, that things are not going to last forever. And so here is the formula for how to make a good prayer that they teach in 18th grade. So I need some people to help because we've got a sign. Do you want to help? Oh, DeForest and Catherine can hold, hold up the first one. Can you hold this up? Can you both stand up tall right up here? Oh, there's going to be, Ollie, you'll get, you can help with the next one. So that says who. So you have to think about who you're directing your prayer about to. So that could be God. That could be the one I, the prayer I'm talking about with the grown-ups. To, to you, you think we should all pray to you? Hmm, interesting. Um, the, the, we sometimes at our church sing or pray about spirit of life, or we say sources of reason and radiance, sources of courage and compassion. So there's a lot of ways you can start a prayer. The one I'm teaching the grown-ups, it starts, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Do you guys have any ideas of who might be the who in a prayer? DeForest mm -hmm. is suggesting themselves. Okay, that's an option. Any other ideas? God, what do you think, May? Uh, nature. nature, oh, I like that, yeah. Nature's a good one. Any other ideas? Okay, I need, you guys gotta keep holding up the sign. Do you need someone to, to, set, to take your plan? Take your place. I'm good. You're good. Catherine, do you want someone to take your place? Okay. Oh, Georgina, can you come up and hold that sign with DeForest? Okay. Now we need the next sign. Oh, how about um, May and Avery? I'm trying to look for people who are similar heights. Uh, pretty close. Okay. Come stand right over here. Do you want to help too? We yeah. can probably get three hands okay. on this. Okay, can you can you help? And you guys can help help too. I think you, I think we're, I just hold it. Oh, I guess you guys can get the next one. Okay, I just get, stand it. there and be ready. So, can you hold it up super high, Ollie? Super high. What does that say? Anybody? We. 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 So this is the who is praying part. So often in church, that's kind of implied that it's the people who are here, but sometimes you can say. We're at our Thanksgiving table and we're feeling so grateful. Or we could say, we're feeling scared and alone today. Or we could say, what else could we say when we're in a prayer? What could we say, I'm happy today and so grateful? Could we say, I'm feeling frightened? Could we say, we're glad to be together? Those are all things. Oh, keep holding it up. Super high, Ollie. And then the last one, me and Avery, is so. So this is the so what, right? So it could, so this is the what you might be asking for in that moment. So it could be, give us this day our daily bread. It could be, may the suffering be soothed, may the sick be tended. What else might you want to pray for? Oh, what do you think? To play Rampage World Tour all day. To play Rampage World Tour all day, yeah. Yes. I mean, whoever we're praying to, whoever this this who is, it's not actually like a genie that grants wishes though, right? Rampage World Tour is a video game. It is a video game and I know it and I also really love it. So we should play sometime. But 
You get to be like a Godzilla destroying yeah. a city. It's you really get, satisfying. You get to be, um, yeah, well, we can talk about it more later, Teddy. <laughs> what else might we pray for? Me, 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 me. Hmm, would we pray maybe to feel less afraid or less worried? Me. Would we pray to be safe? Could we pray for all kinds of things like that? Me. Any other ideas? I just talk. Okay, so now you guys know the formula. So it's who? We sow. And now these grown ups know it too. So if you ever feel like you need to make a prayer for something, whether that's in your own heart or maybe somebody at Thanksgiving looks at you and says, You're giving grace this year, now you have the formula. And you didn't even have to go to 18th grade to get it. So thank you all for helping me talk this through and teach some grown-ups and teach some kids a little bit more about prayer today and we are going to sing you to your classes thank you i'll help you get there go forth in peace in search of wisdom with love to guide you on your People's people are generous people, and we care for each other in so many ways. Two Sundays ago, during a wonderful service, well, a wonderful service that we also learned was a COVID spreading event, right? <laughs> and the way people's people stepped up to care for each other was incredible. Right? There were people who were sending cards. There were people who were taking over AV work or other things to try to let people isolate when they needed to. And as far as I'm aware, after our, our few days of spread, there were no further cases in our community except for people who lived in the same house as someone who was infected, which is incredible, you guys. I am, I am so impressed with that level of care, that level of commitment to following scientific best practices, to wearing masks, to being distant from each other, to participating on Zoom rather than in person. All of that kept, kept each other safe. And as far as I am aware, all of the cases that people had were quite mild. So that's amazing. Thank you for the care that all of us held for one another and keeping each other safe. This is the moment where I invite you to continue to be the generous and caring people that you are. The offering will now be received. Thank you. 
If you all would join me in giving thanks for all that sustains us, from the countless gifts we have each been given, gifts of life and love and sustenance, we bring these small portions to share in the works of love which none of us can accomplish alone. Our church is a community that supports one another in good times and hard times. One of the ways that we do that is we take time when we are gathered to share the joys and sorrows and milestones of our lives. This is the time in the service where we invite those who wish to, who have something to share, to type it into the chat box if they're with us on Zoom, or to come forward, place a, a stone in our bowl of water, and share briefly. Joys and sorrows we hold quietly in our hearts today, the joy and sorrow in our wider community and in our wider world. Sources of reason and radiance, sources of courage and compassion, keep watch with those who work or watch or weep this day. May the suffering be soothed. May the weary find rest. May the sick be tended. May the dying and those who love them find peace. May the joyous be shielded. May all of us know we are wrapped in a love that surrounds us always, a web that connects us to all that exists. Our words for meditation today are a resetting of the Lord's Prayer from a New Zealand prayer book. This is the book used for worship by the Anglican Church in Aotearoa, New Zealand and Polynesia. Aotearoa is the word for New Zealand and Maori, the language of the people indigenous to that land. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and all that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God, in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. And the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. From the trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen.
This is A Cold Rain the Day Before Spring by Stuart Kestenbaum, who happens to be the poet laureate of Maine. From heaven it falls on the gray pitted ice that has been here since December. In the gutter, rivulets erode piles of dirt and road salt into small countries, and the morning is so dark. In school, teachers turn on fluorescent lights and everyone comes in smelling of damp wool. From heaven it falls, just the opposite of prayer, which I send up at the traffic light. Please let me begin over again, one more time over again. Wipe the slate clean, the same way after school janitors, keys jangling from belt loops, will use a wet rag and wipe the school day off. So there is only the residue, faint white on the smooth surface. It's the same way the infield looks before the game begins or the ice on a rink between periods. All new again for the moment and glistening. Imagine each day you get to start again and again, again. How many days does the janitor enter the room of your soul, wipe it clean, go out into the hallway and push his broom down the long corridor full of doors to so many rooms. This is Mary Oliver's The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? The grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Eagle poem. To pray, you open your whole self to sky, to earth, to moon, to one whole voice that is you. And know that there is more that you can't see, can't hear, can't know except in moments, steadily growing, and in languages that aren't always sound, but other circles of motion. Like Eagle that Sunday morning over Salt River, circled in blue sky and wind, swept our hearts clean with sacred wings. We see you. We see ourselves and know that we must take the utmost care and kindness in all things. Breathe in, knowing we are made of all this, and breathe, knowing we are truly blessed because we were born and die soon within a true circle of motion, like eagle rounding out the morning inside us. We pray that it will be done in beauty, in beauty. We'll start all together. There is a love holding us. <clears throat> there is a love holding all that we love. There is a love holding all we rest 
lost in this love there is a love holding us there is a love holding all that we love there is a love holding all we in this love there is a love holding us there is a love holding all that we love there is a love holding us we in this love one last time all together there is a love holding us there is a love holding all that we love there is a love holding all we A few months ago, I stood right here and asked people to say the Lord's Prayer with me, which is a rare occurrence in this church. But a prayerful cacophony erupted as most of the hundreds of people packed into this room, the foyer and the hallways prayed aloud together. This was at the memorial service for Matt Johnson, a church member who died suddenly in July and hundreds of people gathered to remember and grieve him and celebrate his life. Because Matt grew up in the Christian tradition and the Lord's Prayer is meaningful to his parents, his sister, and others, it was part of the service. Here's one version, and if these words are meaningful to you, I invite you to say them alongside me, whatever version you like. If not, just listen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. That morning in July, in this sweltering space, it was meaningful to have a group of folks who didn't all know each other, but who all loved Matt speaking in unison, or close to unison. There's the parts where people disagree about what word to say. It was moving to me, and several people's people in attendance said the same thing, as did other folks, including someone who made a point of saying, I'm Jewish, but praying the Lord's Prayer was really meaningful and was kind of surprised by that experience. All this led me to wonder about this prayer. Where is it from? What does it mean? What could it mean for us? So first, some terminology. Catholics generally call this prayer the Our Father, and they have a shorter version, and Protestants call it the Lord's Prayer, and nearly all Christians pray this when they gather for worship. If you attend Christian worship repeatedly, you memorize it, you know it by heart. Often, children learn this prayer without knowing what the words mean. So as a child, a friend of mine thought God was always painting in heaven because our Father who art in heaven, right? <laughs> she didn't know what those verb tenses meant. And there are so many anecdotes about children thinking God's first name is Howard, Howard be thy name. <laughs> and others about kids who think they're praying not to be led into Penn Station. 
which as someone who has gotten so lost in New York City's Penn Station more than once is a prayer close to my heart. <laughs> if you were taught this as a child, perhaps you have a story like this too. These are taught without explaining what all of these old and sometimes archaic words mean. So where are these words from? There are two versions of something close to the Lord's Prayer in the Bible. Both responses Jesus gave when his followers asked him how to pray. It's once in the Gospel of Matthew, once in the Gospel of Luke. And here's some more stuff I learned in 18th grade in seminary. Within the Gospels, there, which are four different versions of Jesus' life story, uh, they were all written down about a genera- at least a generation after Jesus lived. And there's overlap across the different four Gospels. And as a broad rule, the more often something is mentioned, the more likely the scholars think it is to actually have happened in Jesus's lifetime. And to add even more complications, the Gospels were first written in Greek, but Jesus spoke Aramaic, so it's hard to know exactly what he would have said. But nevertheless, having two versions of a prayer pretty close to the Lord's Prayer is a pretty good indication that Jesus said it or something very close to it. The ancient source that's closest to the Protestant version of the Lord's Prayer, which has for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory tacked on at the end, Catholics usually don't say that part, is in another text called the Didache, which means the teaching in the Greek of that era. And so it's written in Greek by early Jesus followers in the late first century. And it's almost a manual for how to be a church, but church is not a word they were using yet. So the Didache includes the most important teachings and instructions for how to pray, how to do a baptism, how to do communion, and rules for church governance. Because even before they were calling themselves a church, they knew that the governance mattered. And the Lord's Prayer is part of the how to pray section of that text. So among the earliest followers of Jesus, the New Testament as we know it now was not a a tidy collection of writings all bound together in one book called the New Testament. There were all of these different writings that hadn't been gathered together. And so different communities of Jesus followers used different texts and people started praying the Lord's Prayer in the Didache. But when the leaders of the church created the New Testament in the fourth century, the Didache didn't make the cut. So it's not in Bibles, yet people know the words by heart and have passed them down. And about the words, what do they mean? First, it's important to notice that this is a prayer, not a creed. It isn't a statement of belief. So many of the things we say in unison at Christian worships are, I believe in one God, the Father, you know all of these things if you've done Christian worship a few times. But this is different, it's a prayer. And as John Dominic Crossan, who's an Irish American New Testament scholar writes, it's prayed by all Christians, but it never mentions Christ. It's prayed by fundamentalist Christians, but it never mentions the inerrancy of the Bible. It's prayed by Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Roman Catholic Christians, but never mentions congregations, priests, bishops, or popes. It's prayed by Christians who split from one another over this or that doctrine, but it never mentions a single one of those doctrines. It's prayed by Christians who focus on the next life, but it never mentions the next life. It's prayed by Christians who emphasize what it never mentions, and also by Christians who ignore what it does. And it is a profoundly Jewish prayer, because Jesus was a Jew, not a Christian, obviously. Christianity hadn't been invented yet. And the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught is deeply rooted in the first century Judaism that Jesus practiced. John Dominic Crossan again states, it's a prayer from the heart of Judaism on the lips of Christianity for the conscience of the world. So what does it say? First, our Father, the hour and the Father both matter here. Our is collective. The Jesus who instructs people to pray, it's not a personal action, it's a communal action. 
not to my father, but to everyone's parent, everyone in God's community. And the first gesture of the prayer is both a reach up to the transcendent with the divine father and a reach out to one's neighbor. We are praying this together, or I am praying it on all of our behalf. The prayer is not a personal request. It's meant to be said with others. Our father, give us, forgive us, lead us not. It's a prayer for a whole community, perhaps the whole world. And the father. I, perhaps like some of you, bristle at the gendered language here, and I appreciate the reworking of the Lord's Prayer from New Zealand that I shared earlier. It, it goes, eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and all that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God. Jesus lived and taught in an incredibly patriarchal culture in a place dominated by the Roman Empire. And his use of father was both reflective of his culture, God, it was imagined as male, and subversive. Amy Jill Levine is a Jewish New Testament scholar at Vanderbilt Divinity School, who was one of my favorite guest preachers when I served a church in Nashville. We'd have her come as often as she would agree to come. And she points out that that Roman emperors were addressed as father by their subjects. And so in this prayer, calling God our father, Jesus is rejecting the oppressive foreign empire that was dominating his people. This was a time the land now known as Israel or Palestine was part of the Roman empire. The prayer is an, ex an expression of loyalty, not to the most powerful man in the world, the emperor, but to a God of love and justice. It was subversive. And the, crit the critiques of systems of empire and domination continue with the line, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because the Greek word that's translated as kingdom, basileia, is better translated as empire. And to the community of Jesus and the Didache, empire meant the Roman empire. This prayer calls for a new empire, God's empire. And this is not a theocracy, not with some people saying they speak on behalf of God as they create their government, but a reign of love and justice. Because throughout Jesus's teachings, he describes the empire of God, the kingdom of heaven. And over and over again, he says it's a world where the current hierarchies are turned upside down, where the last shall be first and the first shall be last where all are valued and all have enough. Beloved community is another word for that sort of vision. And a land where people were ruled by force, dominated by foreign empires, and so many did not have enough to meet their basic needs. Praying for an empire of God reminded people that a better world was possible. It was a practice of hope that we still need today. The New Zealand prayer calls for the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world, your commonwealth of peace and freedom, sustain our hope and come on earth. Next is give us this day our daily bread. It's a weird repetition, isn't it? Give us our daily bread or give us this day our bread probably would have been enough. And the Greek word that is translated as daily is not found anywhere else in the Bible. And so the scholars don't really know what it means. So one New Testament scholar that I trust and respect says that that daily means for today, while another says it means for tomorrow. But regardless, it's a modest request, right? This is the only tangible request in the Lord's Prayer, and it's for bread, not for a lifetime supply of bread, just enough for today and maybe tomorrow. Amy Jill Levine points out that this is not just waiting for the bread to show up either, but a personal call to action. She writes, for God actually gives not bread, but grain. Bread comes from human effort. Bread does not come from the earth directly. The Lord's prayer is not an abstract wish for food to drop down from heaven. 
It's a concrete petition that God will motivate our hearts to do the right thing. It insists that humanity and divinity work together. Most of us, most of the time, can buy our bread from the store and don't have a daily reminder of the partnership between the earth, the grain, the yeast, and human effort that make bread possible, that the first hearers of this prayer did. And this week, I made Martha Beverly's Swedish limpa bread and remember that baking good bread requires care and attention. And even when I follow Martha's directions perfectly, it feels like magic every time the dough actually rises. I can understand why people would pray for that, especially when they're not getting their yeast in handy little packets, but just trying to keep their starter alive perpetually. Then the prayer asks for forgiveness and offers forgiveness. We are forgiving debts or sins or trespasses, depending on what version of the prayer we say. And why are there so many versions? My colleague, Elizabeth Buki Santer wrote, trespasses isn't in the biblical text. And Matthew says debts, and Luke has sort of a combination of debts and sins. In Matthew, the story has Jesus teaching the prayer and going on to say, for if you give others their offenses, your heavenly father will forgive you also. And that word offenses is usually translated trespasses. So that's where it comes from. And it sort of migrated earlier in the prayer over time. And this probably happened because the first mass produced English Bible in the 1500s used trespasses. And that was used as the basis for the first Anglican book of prayer. So Episcopalians and Catholics are more likely to, use, to say trespasses, while most other pro most Protestants say sins or debts. So you can kind of tell somebody's religious journey based on how they say the Lord's Prayer. And I appreciate this slippery word. There are times when what I need to be forgiven for or to forgive is debt, monetary or otherwise. Other times it's sin, all of the times I miss the mark. It isn't often trespasses. I find that a little too abstract for me, but it's nice to have that as an option. And we all long for times for our, when our metaphorical slate can be wiped clean so we can be, begin again, like the blackboard or the infield or the ice rink in Stuart Kestenbaum's poem that Matthew read earlier. And I love it when people say the words that is meaningful to them. So we start all in unison and then it goes and then we all get back in unison again. There's something really magical about that. I also love the parallelism in this line. So forgive us as we forgive those. We are both the ones who need forgiveness and the ones who can offer it. And I know I sometimes need to work to let go of a grudge or offer or offer forgiveness for others. And it's nice to have a prayer that makes that feel like a normal human experience. Maybe you need that sometimes too. Being in right relationship requires us to both offer and receive forgiveness. And we are perpetually giving and receiving. From you I receive, to you I give. Together we share, from this we live, we sing here so often. And it echoes in this prayer. So there's more that I could say about the words in this prayer because there are shelves of books written about it. I'm gonna pause for that for now and switch topics for a moment. Mary Oliver writes in the poem we heard earlier, I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention. While Joy Harjo instructs, to pray you open your whole self to sky, to earth, to sun, to moon, to one whole voice that is you. These poets point to a purpose of prayer. It is an act of noticing, of paying attention to what matters, of finding a stillness, stilling our bodies and our minds, opening ourselves to the world larger than us, remembering that in the grand scheme of things, we are small and the world is immense. Every wisdom tradition that I know of has a practice like this, prayer or meditation, often in a group. The repetition of prayers or mantras or what other words that can bring calm and attention and the realization of our own connectedness. And as Unitarian Universalists, 
And even among the smaller subset of us who are praying Unitarian Universalists, we don't always agree on the who in the prayers, whether it's God or nature or any of the other ideas. My own child who suggested we start praying to them. But we know that prayer and meditation and other practices that help us still ourselves are good for us, return us to our calm center and allow us to live with integrity. The words of the Lord's Prayer are not what mattered most when people recited it here in July. Yes, I just explained the words in the historical context and all of that, but that was not what created the moving moment at Matt Johnson's memorial service. The practice was being together and speaking together reminded us that we are not alone in our grief and otherwise. Having something meaningful to say together united us all in that feeling of grief and loss. In a different cultural context, it would have been a different set of words but it probably would have done the same work. Here, late July, it was the Lord's Prayer. And in that moment, we were connected to each other in this space, but also to a tradition of billions of people across thousands of years, stretching back to the first century as pe of people who had prayed as Jesus taught his followers to pray. I'm not suggesting that you pray the Lord's Prayer if that's not something you do already. Most people at People's Church have left Christian traditions, and these words might not fit anymore if they ever did. I do, however, hope you have a practice that helps you pay attention. I hope you have words that you know by heart that you can turn to in, time, in hard times. I hope you have habits that remind you that the world is bigger and more interdependent than whatever loss or grief or worry that we are carrying with us on any particular day. And so the next time when you're with someone praying the way Jesus taught, perhaps at a family Thanksgiving table or, or a memorial service or elsewhere, perhaps what I've shared today will help you approach the moment with a generosity of spirit. Perhaps you will murmur along, maybe stumbling over the words you don't remember, knowing a bit more about what that prayer means. Perhaps you too can ask for just enough, critique systems of power and oppression, envision beloved community, and feel connected to people across time, space, language, and belief. Or perhaps you can just sit in silent awe that the words of a first century Jewish prayer are still so meaningful to so many today. May it be so. May we make it so. And amen. I invite you one last time today to rise in body or spirit to sing our closing song together. Pretty simple to follow. Walking, walking with you, walking with you is my prayer. That's the whole song, now you. Walking, walking with you, walking with you is my prayer. One more time for walking. Walking, walking with you, walking with you is my prayer. I love the harmony is starting to peek out singing 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 with you singing with you is my prayer singing again singing 
singing with you singing with you is my prayer being 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 with you being with you is my prayer being being with you being with you is my prayer working 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 with you working with you is my prayer working working with you working with you is my prayer we return to walking and walking walking with you walking with you is my prayer last time with walking 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 with you walking with you is my prayer So as we leave this space, whether prayer for us looks like the way Jesus taught or walking, singing, being, working, let us find the calm stillness, those words we know by heart that return us to our best selves and go out to love a world that needs our love. Let us go in peace and go in love. <laughs>